Hi everybody, we're going to start off with a urinary system overview of those organs and specifically we are talking about ureters, urinary bladder, and urethra. The information found on page 112, characteristics of urine, duplicates what you've heard in lab. That is simply a read-through page. At the top of page 113, you'll notice that we're going to talk first about the ureters. They collect fluids, urine, from the collecting ducts in the nephrons. Those collecting ducts send urine to the papillary ducts, to the renal papilla, onto the minor and major calyces, renal pelvis, and then to the ureter. So the ureter is nothing more than a collecting tube that travels from the hilus of each kidney, connects down to the posterior side of the urinary bladder. That's why in this image we're looking at the connection from the kidneys to the bladder from a posterior view. All right, so these kidneys, of course, produce urine at a constant rate. The urine, ureters should be carrying that uh, urine down to the urinary bladder for storage. So let's talk a little more about the construction of a typical ureter. This should look somewhat familiar. This is similar to the way the digestive system is constructed. There is an innermost mucosa lining here, and you may recall from Bio 210, this is made up of transitional epithelial tissue. And what makes that special is it's a stretchy type of epithelium. There is a muscular layer here that provides peristalsis that helps to milk along the urine that's in the ureters that moves the urine down toward the urinary bladder. This fibrous coat is a connective tissue layer. It's also called the adventitia layer on the outside surface. Interesting, just a side note here, there's a lot of adipose tissue surrounding this picture. The next organ in the urinary system we're going to discuss is called the urinary bladder, and this is a storage tank for urine. You know, you will sense the feeling of having to urinate at about 200 milliliters of fluid in here. At 500 milliliters of fluid, you're going to feel a strong urge and a strong need to urinate. At uh, one liter, this is an extremely full bladder, and sometimes if it gets that full, a catheter has to be inserted to pull the fluids out of the bladder. So this is meant to be, again, a stretchy organ, just like the ureters, and that's why we also see transitional epithelial tissue lining the inside here. There is a region here called the trigon, and that is created by the openings of the ureters, or ureters and the urinary bladder empties here into the urethra. So we can just draw a triangle between those three areas and create what's called a trigon. So you may wonder why this is important. This is an area where uh, urinary bladder infections or UTIs may reside. Of course, urine is gonna collect down here at the bottom portion of the ur uh, urinary bladder, and that would mean that that area gets the most constant contact with toxins that may be in that urine. Let me also make a note here that we try to say urinary bladder and just instead of bladder, because there is yet another bladder in the body that would be our gallbladder. So we do try to distinguish by calling this one the urinary bladder. Same setup here, an internal lining of transitional epithelial tissue, a muscular layer, and a fibrous adventitia that covers the outside surface of the urinary bladder. You'll also notice some ligaments here that help to anchor the bladder in place. That's really all that keeps it held together in the body are ligaments that attach it to your body wall. There are also two sphincters that guard the base of the urinary bladder. There is an internal sphincter. You'll notice it's made of smooth muscle. And there's an external urinary sphincter or urethral sphincter, and it is made of skeletal muscle. So which one of these can you voluntarily control? That would be the skeletal muscle. Okay, so that is the one that you have to consciously keep closed in order for urine to be kept in the urinary bladder. That's why it takes babies until around age two or three to perform a good job of keeping their bladders closed until they will the urine to leave. And that's why later in life, if someone runs into nervous system problems, we may see uh, incontinence an inability to keep the urine in the bladder. We know that internal urethral sphincter is involuntary, and that is the one that you do not have control over. All right, so that should take us down to the bottom of page 113. Let me flip you over to page 114, and we'll talk more now about voiding or micturition. Okay, 
So when you feel a stretch in this urinary bladder, the walls begin to expand and there are baroreceptors here that send signals to your brain. So this is when you start to feel the urge to go to the bathroom. We call this urge or, or this uh, emptying of your bladder micturition. So it can be known by other terms such as urination, voiding, or emptying the urinary bladder. So notice you're going to feel the urge to urinate at about 200 milliliters of urine in the bladder. You have a very strong urge if you hold as much as 500 milliliters. For a point of reference, you may want to pull out a, a water bottle or a soft drink can and see how much one of those holds just for a sake of comparison. In some situations, bladders may hold a lot of urine up to a liter, but that would be an extremely stretched out urinary bladder. So when you have the urge to go to the bathroom, due to stretch receptors in the lining of this uh, urinary bladder, there's a set of nerve fibers that carry this information to the spinal cord. Notice that we travel over a parasympathetic pathway here that heads to the brain and heads out to the cerebral cortex. So you have a conscious sensation of feeling of stretch in that bladder. At this point, you make a conscious decision whether or not you want to open the external urethral sphincter. You send a, another message back down through the spinal cord, but over a somatic pathway that tells that external urethral sphincter to either stay closed or to open. So you should have the conscious control over keeping that uh, urinary bladder closed. So of course, if you have a very full bladder, at some point, your, your will to keep the urinary bladder closed will be overcome by the volume of fluid in there. So micturition is a reflex pathway that goes to your brain for you to have con ultimate control and override decision on that external urethral sphincter. Let's talk about the urethra for just a moment. This should look familiar. Looks like the same construction as the ureter. It too is composed of the same layers transitional epithelial tissue that allows for the stretch of urine traveling through, a muscular layer, and an outermost adventitia layer. Let's also talk a few minutes about disorders. Of course, the job of the urethra is to transport urine to the outside of the body. If it becomes inflamed, oftentimes with bacteria, we call that condition urethritis. A urinary bladder inflammation is called cystitis. That too can be caused by a UTI or some kind of bacterial infection. Kidney inflammation can be called pyelonephritis. And that can also once again be caused by bacteria that back up the urethra, urinary bladder, up the ureter and up to the kidney. That's a long way to travel, but it can happen. Nephrons can become inflamed as well. We call that glomerulonephritis. We now call that acute nephritis or chronic nephritis. In the old days, back in the 1800s, that was called Bright's disease. And it was detected by having excess levels of albumin in the bloodstream. You may recall albumin from our discussion on blood. It's a common blood protein that's important for blood osmotic pressure. Okay, a couple of other things to fill in down there. Diabetes insipidus is a disorder that can affect the kidneys and urine output. We know that is due to the lack of ADH. So you would expect to see increased urine output when you've got diabetes insipidus. Keep in mind, this is not the sugar form or insulin problem that we expect to see with diabetes mellitus. This particular form of diabetes just has excess urination and excess thirst. Finally, kidney disease, or kidney stones rather, renal calculi is our last topic there. And let me show you these. So kidney stones can develop in the kidneys. They can be calcium in nature or they can be oxalic acid in nature. The peristalsis of the ureters will try to milk those kidney stones down toward the urinary bladder. And that's where, of course, the pain comes from that when those uh, stones are stuck or causing bleeding or inflammation in the lining of that ureter. There are all sorts of tricks we have nowadays to go up there and blast those kidney stones or remove them with shunts and allow those pieces to flow out. Uh, but nonetheless, they may be recurrent depending on your genetics and or your diet.